Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. Today we're going to look at Psalm 31. Psalm 31. Now before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and privilege and everything you provided so that we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to study your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 31 is an individual lament psalm. If you remember, lament psalm is a prayer or a cry out to God when the psalmist, the one who wrote the psalm, is in some sort of need. He may be in pain, suffering, sick. He may be in a time of great stress like war, disaster. He may be slandered by enemies or even physically threatened by enemies. So he calls out to God for help. Now, the first part of this psalm a good part of it is a prayer. It's mixed with some points of trust, but the first major part is prayer. The second major part, let me put them both up there, is praise. That's from verses 19 through 24. The title of this psalm is Life and Trust. It's about our life and how much important and how important it is to trust God through all life circumstances. All right, so we begin with the prayer. The superscription, that is the title, you might say, under the word psalm. For the choir director, a psalm of David. So this was written by David. It was given to the choir director so he could put it to music, and they could sing it or chant it during their worship services. He begins with a prayer about God's righteousness. Verse 1. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Never let me be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me. Obviously, the psalmist, who is David, is talking to the Lord. This is why we see clearly it's a prayer. He tells the Lord he's taken refuge. This is his place of safety, his place of security. Never let me be ashamed. That is, he doesn't want his spiritual life to look bad. He doesn't want anyone to look at him and say, the God of Israel is not his God. He wants to live right before the Lord and not have anyone humiliate him, saying that he's not a Christian. Well, today we'd say he's not a Christian. Today, back then, they'd say he's not a true Israelite. He's not a covenant Israelite with the God of Israel. He goes on to say, in your righteousness, deliver me. David knew God was righteous. The Lord was righteous. He'd do the right thing. And because he knows his righteous righteous, he asked the Lord to deliver him. Deliver him for whatever he's having to go through. Now we're not told exactly what it is, but we do see this wonderful attitude of his going to the Lord when he's in trouble. Obviously there were those who were trying to humiliate him, to put him to shame, but he's going to rely on the Lord who's righteous, who always does the right thing, to deliver him. In verse 2, he continues his cry for help. Turn your ear to me. Quickly rescue me. Be to me a rock of safety. A house of strongholds to save me. <clears throat> he tells the Lord, turn your ear to me. That's another way of saying, listen to me. Listen up. Quickly rescue me. Be to me a rock of safety. 
back in those days, one of the best hiding places was go to the mountains. Because it was hard to track people in the mountains. It was hard to reach people if they got into certain places in the mountains. Here he keeps using these type of natural formations out there as a figure of speech for the Lord to protect him. A house of strongholds. Boy, that sounds like a place with where people live and there's lots of forts around it. That's kind of the idea here. It's such a strong dwelling place that the Lord protects him in a way that no one can possibly get to him. He wants to be in a place where he's untouchable by all his enemies. He continues, verse 3. For you are my rock and my fortress. For the sake of your name, you lead me and guide me. Two things are being said here. He tells the Lord, you're my rock. That means you're that place up in the mountains, up in the cliffs where no one can reach me, that inaccessible high place. No one can climb up there. No one knows I'm there. And if they start to attack, I can easily defend it. And he says, and my fortress, my fort, for the sake of your name. Now this means the name is one's reputation, his character, what he stands for. You've probably heard of people saying, well, he has a good name. That means he has a good character. For the sake of the Lord's name, and we know about the Lord. He's righteous. He's merciful. Totally fair. He's justice. For the sake of his character, Lord, keep your character and lead me and guide me. Lead me out of this situation. Guide me out of what situation I'm in. Now, there's a good lesson there. When you get in trouble, when you know people are after you, go to the Lord about it. Talk to him about it. People are picking on me at school. There's some bullies who are after me. There's a gang who's after me. There may be other types of people or situations where you feel like you're in danger. You go to the Lord about it. You put it in the Lord's hands. You claim Him as your place of safety. Now, another thing I want you to see here is we'll start to see it through this psalm. He keeps calling God the Lord. Now, I've went over this many times, but this is something we need to make sure we understand. When we see this word in Scripture, L-O-R-D, that is the translation of the Hebrew word Yahweh. Y-A-H-W-E-H. That is the personal name of God. So it's the Lord God. Many claim to have their own gods in the ancient world. That's with a small g. The God of Israel was the Lord. All right. Today, we call him Jesus. He is Lord in the sense that he is the master. All right. And he's also the Christ. He's the anointed one, the king. Now, under the old covenant, the covenant name between Israel and Israel's God was Yahweh. So when you see this word capitalized, we're looking at that personal name. So he's going to start bringing in this personal name. Lord, Lord God. Now keep that in your mind because it's not the way we use it today in the New Testament. All right? Lord is a translation of the personal name Yahweh. That means basically he always exists. That's what Yahweh means. I am. I am. I'm eternal. I am the eternal existing one. That's what that means. He always exists. How do you name someone who's eternal? You call them basically something that do with eternity. 
I am who I am. That's the idea behind it. I'm the eternal one. That's what he's saying. So, the Lord God, Lord is the name of the personal name for the God of Israel. So, David will use that some nine times in this psalm. But he goes on and he continues asking for the Lord's guidance and leading, as we just saw in verse 3. Verse 4, You will free me from the net they hid for me, for you are my refuge. Now he anticipates the Lord delivering him from the traps. You've seen people set traps, perhaps snares for animals out in the fields. They might cover them up with grass or limbs or or uh, weeds of some sort so no one will see the trap. Well, David's telling the Lord. He says, you're going to free me from those. He knows the Lord is. Why? Because you're my refuge. You're my protection. In other words, you're not going to let me get trapped because you're the one who's going to protect me. Doesn't David have a lot of confidence? Yes, he does. He expects the Lord to deliver him because the Lord is his refuge. He goes on, verse 5. Into your hand I entrust my life, and you will deliver me, O Lord, God of truth. Boy, these two lines have a lot in them. Into your hand, that's like saying, into your care, I entrust, I place, I commit my life. That's the word for spirit. His spirit. His human spirit. <clears throat> <clears throat> that part of the inner person that makes a person alive. When you're born, you get a human spirit. It's, all the, it's also the human spirit that when you're born again, or born from above, that is, you become a believer, that's part of you that communicates to God. That's your spiritual being. So what he's saying is, into your hand... I entrust my spiritual being, his inner life. You will deliver me, O Lord. There's a word, Yahweh. Notice he calls him God of truth. He's a God of truth. You see, he knows, God knows everything. He knows he's innocent. He knows his enemies are guilty. He knows the uh, motivations and the evil behind his enemies and how they're going to try and trap him. And he expects the God of truth, who knows everything, the truth about everybody, not only what they think, but what they're going to do, that he will deliver him. God knows all the truth on these matters, and he acts on it. It's a good thing to know that when people are after you, that the God of truth is on your side. He's always completely aware of the matter. And let me just point something out to you that's very interesting. This first line, into your hand I entrust my life. You don't probably recognize it, but this was a line that was quoted by Jesus Christ on the cross. When Christ was about to die, we translate it this way uh, in Luke 23, 46, when he actually says, let me put it up here for you, it may sound familiar now. Into your hands I commit my spirit. The Lord Jesus said this while he was on the cross and is about to die. Shortly after this, he died. His spirit left the body. So this is being said at the point of his death. Jesus was trusting God, his heavenly Father, with his spiritual being, the spiritual life. We know the body went to the tomb, didn't it? Uh, we learn in the New Testament that the Spirit actually went down into Sheol to proclaim to the dead spirits down there that Christ had had victory on the cross. Now, if you don't know that story, that's something you may have to learn in the New Testament studies. 
The point from this verse is, is that Jesus, at the point of death, was trusting the Father with his life. And David had said this line that Jesus quoted some thousand years before when he was in a very bad situation, and he just tells the Lord, you have my life. You have my life. Very important lesson to learn. Jesus Christ did it. The great King David did it. When things got tough and looked like you're about to die, you put your life in the hands of the Lord. The Lord Jesus, all right, he put his hands into the hands of the Father. Excuse me, he put his life into the hands of the Father as he was about to die. And he went ahead and died, didn't he? Three days later, he was resurrected. All of that was in the Father's hands. David is putting it in the Lord's hands when he was in a very difficult situation. Now, he could have died too, but he didn't. He'll die later. The point is, when things get tough, we see both David and our Lord announce that they commit their lives to God the Father. Something we should never forget. When things get tough, make sure you commit yourself to God the Father. Beginning in verse 6, we see some words of trust. Listen to what he says. David speaks. He writes, I hate those who observe worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. David's pretty clear. He hates the people who, lo who just love to serve idols. Now, we see hate in the sense of he despises them. He disdains them. He, has, he wants nothing to do with people who worship false gods. Now, this word for worthless idols, it's kind of a funny word. Um... It's saying they're worthless nothings. Worthless nothings. Why would you worship a piece of wood or a piece of stone? And you've seen those statues. You see them a lot in the far east of the Buddha and similar type of statues, a little fat guy. And that's nothing but a rock shaped like whatever that's supposed to be. All right? That's nothing. It's a rock. Pick up any brick or rock, same thing. All right? Some other religions worship animals. Now, why would you worship an animal? An animal is a creature that's actually below a human being. So that doesn't make any sense at all. Besides, it has no powers. It has nothing to worship. It's not worthy of worship. Only God is worthy of worship. David is saying he doesn't like to be around those people. They worship the wrong God. They don't worship a God. They worship a rock or a stone. Or, or worthless nothingness. Even has the idea of falsehood. It's phony. Now today there are many idols that take different forms in modern countries like the United States, places in Europe. And idols can be very tempting. You hear people talk about idols. There's some show called something idol. But that's really some entertainment thing. The idea about idols is people worship people sometimes. Sports figures movie or TV stars, a very rich businessman, maybe a politician or something they believe in, a movement, a cause. Some people worship money because they think that's their security. But you know what? You can die and still have a billion dollars when you die. But then it's gone. I mean, you're gone. It's You don't get to take it anywhere. Right? So that means nothing. The world is full of totally worthless idols. Idols are things that come between you and God. Things that people trust in. Things that people worship. And don't kid yourself, a lot of people worship movie stars and sports figures or their sports team. In fact, they'll, they'll go to, on Sundays, they'll dream about their team more than they will God. On days of worship, they'll go and basically worship their team. Watch them participate. Holler for them. I'm not saying you can't like teams and be for them, but no way do they get any kind of worship. No way should they be any kind of idol. 
They're just basically toys. All right, that's kind of one way to look at it. They're not that important. They're something to have fun with, and that's fine. But don't make it your life. Don't make it more important. Don't make anything more important than our Lord God and Jesus Christ. In verse 7, he talks about how he views things. I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distresses of my life. You know, loving kindness is basically God's gracious love and good acts towards his children. Even when he's going through difficult times, he expects God to do good things. That's the affliction. Distresses the pressures of life. He expects God to treat him in his good, loving kindness. Now you think about that. If you're in trouble, you don't have to look back very far sometimes and see how maybe things were bad for you for some reason. Maybe you were sick or your parents were sick or you had to move or some emergency in the family. Something happened and God's loving kindness provided for you. That's what he does. You can look back, you can look forward and say, you're going to rejoice when that happens again. That's what David's doing. I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distresses of my life. Even though the Lord knows you're going through difficult times, he's going to give you what you need. Verse 8. Another act of loving kindness and you have not given me over to the hand of the enemy. And uh, the enemy, you enable me to stand in a wide open place. See, the enemy were trying to get David. He was a king of Israel. Some of them didn't want him king of Israel. Some of them didn't want Israel. Even within his own kingdom, there are those who don't want David as king. He was the prime target. And you think of it, he was the king of Israel, God's people, the anointed king. Don't you know the devil was after him? Sure he was. And the devil uses godless people, so godless people were after him too. And yet David says, you enable me to stand in a wide open place. I could be right out in the open, but he's totally protected because the Lord is with him. We'll see more of that in a moment. When the, when the Lord is with him, when David is living righteously, he's perfectly secure from the worst of enemies, even in a wide open place. The prayer continues in verse 9 when he says, Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress. Now he's going back to a time when he was really going through a difficult time. My eyes waste away in vexation. Um, Vexation means an anger and grief. Starting to describe some of his physical problems he's having. You know, sometimes when you're going under a lot of mental stress, it starts to affect your body. Also, my breath is nephish. That means this here is his breath. The way he breathes, it's one of the words for breath. And my stomach would include his digestive system are impaired. That means he's having problems. He's going through so much stress he can't breathe right. He can't digest his food right. And if you ever had really serious problems, you know what I'm talking about. You can't sleep. You can't eat right. Your body's not functioning right because you're in such stress. David has learned that when he goes under great stress and even his body is not handling it very well, he calls to the Lord to be merciful. You call to the Lord when things get so difficult, especially they start to affect your health. Verse 10 goes on to describe how, things, how bad things got. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years in groaning my strength has failed because of my iniquity, and my bones waste away. Now this is interesting that this tells us even when he's walking with the Lord, he'll occasionally have his sin, like we all do, 
hopefully it's not very often. But there can be times when things are so tough. You're depending on the Lord. You're depending on the Lord. Maybe you'll take a moment to sin. You'll find some short way out and you're not thinking clearly and you do something sinful. That's really the way our lives are. We're never living our lives perfect. But here we see sort of the overall picture of David's going through a very difficult time. And even a difficult time where he's trying to depend on the Lord, he falls short and sins. So he sees his body, years of groaning. It's like he's been going on for a long, long time. He's weak. His bones are wasting away. He can't hardly stand up anymore. His strength is failing. His body's going downhill. Add to that, it's getting worse and worse for him, isn't it? Verse 11. Look at the people around him. Because of all my enemies, I am a reproach. That means people don't even want to be around him. He has so many enemies. So many people dislike him. People don't want to be around him. Even his neighbors. Look at that. Especially to my neighbors. An object of dread to my acquaintances. Those he just barely knows. He may say hi to them on the street. He don't really know them well. They're not good friends. Neighbors could be good friends. But they're rejecting him too. Those who see me in the street flee from me. That's how bad it is. He's so miserable. He's having so many problems. People avoid him. Everyone. This is the type of person that people gossip about. Run down. Pretty soon no one wants to be around him. And he still hadn't done anything. You see? Well, it gets worse. Verse 12. I am forgotten as a dead man. Out of mind, I am like a broken vessel. It couldn't get any worse than this. Remember I told you a while ago when he said, Into, me, into your hands, I entrust my life. This is when he does that. He realizes that people have completely rejected him as king, as a spiritual leader. <clears throat> I'm forgotten as a dead man, out of mind. People don't even think about me. They don't want to think about me. I'm a broken vessel, you know, like a broken clay pot. What's that good for? Nothing. He says his life has become worthless, like a broken vessel. It has no use. He is of no use. Verse 13, he goes back and describes what his enemies are saying, what they're doing. Even though he's down and sick and miserable, a broken vessel. Verse 13, for I have heard the slander of many, terror from all around. While they schemed together against me, they plotted to take away my life. With all the problems he's got, now he's got enemies who notice this terror from all around, all around him. It may be individuals, it may be groups, it may be some sort of organization, it may be uh, family members, people in the kingdom, outside the kingdom. Everywhere he turns, he has enemies, you see. A very difficult situation. <clears throat> David shares something with Jeremiah the prophet. He talked about terror all around. Jeremiah was a prophet in a very difficult time of Israel. The country was going down. It was about to be overrun. And God gave Jeremiah a message to tell the people, just surrender. Boy, they didn't like that message from Jeremiah. They threw him in a, a hole in the ground. In the midst of all these troubles, mental and physical misery, plus the spiritual issues he was struggling with in his own life, trying to figure out what's God doing? Why am I going through this? I'm groaning all the time. I'm in pain. I'm not worth anything. Even when he's at the bottom of the barrel, you might say, 
He's just about run out of gas. You know what he does? He does what all faithful Christians do with his great test in his life. He announces that he's going to trust the Lord. Now you think of it. Let me just draw a circle here. I did this when I've taught this lesson before. This big old block. This block is full of his problems, his enemies, his physical problems, his spiritual problems, his mental problems, the hate that he's getting, the slander, the maligning, the great opposition, all the different types of enemies totally surround him. He's down here. I call this block the burden block. With all these burdens on top of him, you know who jumps on you know who jumps on the, the block? Enemies. More enemies jump on the block. So now it's worse and worse and worse. But you know what he says? Listen to verse 14. Look at that block. Then look at this verse. But as for me, I trust in you, Lord, personal name, Yahweh. I say, you are my God. God can easily lift that burden. That's not a problem for him. With one little finger, the Lord his God will take care of him. If he wants that pressure on David, the Lord will keep as much on as he wants it to be. And he'll relieve it when he thinks David has been tested enough. But I want you to notice these personal words. Now, he's saying this, as for me, for myself, I myself, that's the way it is in the Hebrew, I trust in you. Lord. Today we might say, I trust in you, Lord Jesus, my Savior, my Deliverer. You are my God. Notice the word my. Personal. You're my God. No matter what the circumstances, how he feels, how he's doing physically, mentally, spiritually, he will trust in the Lord, his God. You remember this. Whether you're young or old, whether it's in your teenage years or your 20s or 30s or 40s, you trust in the Lord, your God, for all the difficulties that bear down upon you. One of the reasons we have these type of psalms in Scripture is to be a great reminder of the way the Lord took care of David. We even got a glimpse as the Lord took care of Jesus Christ. God the Father took care of Christ. Christ resurrected three days later after his death. David hasn't died yet, but he's just about to. Listen to his words of trust in verse 15 when he says, My times are in your hand, Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. The word for times means circumstances, experiences. He puts everything in the Lord's hands. This burden, the burden block, it's in the Lord's hands, totally in his control. Um, God is so big compared to this burden. I couldn't even begin to write it out because it's endless. Left and right, up and down. There's no comparison to the strength and power that God has over all our burdens. Do you understand what I'm trying to show you here? It is the all-powerful God. God allowed those burdens on David. He can just as well take them away or lighten the load or even better, give him the strength to deal with it 
and pull him through. That's something we should pray for. Instead of praying to take it away, Lord, give me strength. Help me get stronger from it, you see. People are out to get him. He says, deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Persecute also means to chase, to pursue. <clears throat> get those people out of my life. That's what he's asking for. In verse 16, he turns to the Lord for help. Listen to this. Make your face to shine upon your servant. Save me in your loving kindness. When you tell the Lord to make his face shine upon us, it's a way of saying, smile at me. Show me your favor. Show me your grace. Here he says, save me in your loving kindness. Show your goodness towards me your goodness and your grace during this time. That's a word for loving kindness. David asked for the Lord's favor and trusts that he will act in loving kindness towards him. Verse 17, Lord, do not let me be put to shame. For I call upon you, let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be silent and shield. Earlier we saw that he did, want, did not want to be humiliated or put to shame. He asks this again. He calls upon the Lord to take care of that. And then he tells the Lord to do two things for him. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be shamed for their bad deeds, for their attempts to shame him. Let them be silent in Sheol. Now, if you've studied with me much in the Old Testament, Sheol was the place of the dead. He's telling the Lord, let those people just die. Get them out of my life. That way they'll be quiet. They'll quit annoying me. They'll quit slandering me. They'll quit attacking me. Let them be silent and shield. He was tired. He was fed up. He'd had enough. He wants them and their maligning mouths shut up and in shield. He wants them to end. This is what we call an imprecatory prayer. He's praying that God will severely judge these people. David did that now and then. After all, looks at what look at what is at stake. The kingdom, the king, God's people. He's telling God, you can't let these people take me down. It's going to hurt your people, the ones you have a covenant with, an agreement with to love and take care of as long as they are obedient. It doesn't stop there, verse 18. Let the lying lips be mute. You know what mute means. Can't talk. Would speak arrogantly against the righteous, people like David, with pride and contempt. Here we tell, we can tell what their motives are. They're very proud. They think they're greater than David, greater than God, greater than God's king. They know everything. They have all the answers. Notice, which speak arrogantly against the righteous. The righteous are those who live for God, the faithful. And they do it with pride. They're very proud of themselves, sinfully proud, and contempt. They show contempt for David, disdain, disapproval. But David's had enough. He wants them quiet. He wants the Lord to put a complete stop to his mouthy enemies. We already saw he wants them in Sheol where they will be silent. That place below the earth where the dead go. We start our second major portion of this psalm in verse 19. The praise David has seen the Lord act in his life now, at this point. Listen to him. How abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, those who are faithful. You work for those who take refuge in you, before the sons of men. Notice the first two lines. How abundant is your goodness. God has an abundance, plenty of good things for those who fear him. 
for those who live reverent lives, that is, they live lives of obedience, have the proper respect for the Lord. It is those whom he works for, those who take their refuge in him, who see the Lord as their security. And notice where it is, before the sons of men, right in front of people. That's what sons of men mean, people, human beings. So he tells everybody in his praise, God provides great things, and he has great things, many, many great things, good things for those who fear him, for those who see him as their security, right in the midst of people. The Lord actively is working on behalf of those who place their security in the Lord. Don't, th don't forget that. Many Christians talk about the Lord working behind the scenes, and that clearly seems to happen at times, doesn't it? But also, he's right out there in front, working out whatever's going on in your life. You ever think about it? Protects us on the roads, the freeways, from animals, from airplanes, from planes crashing, or trains, or buses, from crime, from terrorists. All kinds of threatening people. Learn to trust in Him. He's much greater than either than any single person or or large group. Any attacking force, God is greater. We t take our refuge in Him. We remember He's our security. Now listen to me. One of the basic characteristics of a faithful Christian is that they look to the Lord for their protection and security. Don't think the world is going to protect you. Don't think the government's going to protect you. Don't think that the police are even going to protect you. God will protect you. He is your security. He is your protection. Now I'm not saying don't call the police if you have a criminal outside your door. No. When it comes to your protection for your spiritual life, for even your physical life, you remember the Lord is first. He is the one who will protect you. You remember that, then you call the police. See what I'm saying? Or grab the gun. Whatever. Verse 20. David continues. He's teaching now for those who read this psalm. You hide them, that's those who fear the Lord. You hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of men. You know, plots are like schemes and plans. You conceal them in a shelter from the slander of tongues. I like this because it's like David's right out in the open. Right in front of people as they plan to kill him or do away with him. But the Lord's right there with him, protecting him. He's the ultimate bodyguard, you might say. You can seal them in a shelter from the slander of tongues. People may attack him with their mouths, with their tongues, with their evil words, but the Lord will protect them. So he protects us right there out in the middle where we're a prime target, but he's right there with us. Now he responds in some closing words of praise. Blessed be the Lord, for he has made marvelous his loving kindness to me in a besieged city. What's this about a besieged city? You know that's a city that's being uh, encircled by the enemy. Uh, and they're starting to climb their walls or break their walls down, shooting arrows over the wall. The city's under siege, as we sometimes call it. You see that in some of the movies sometimes. David's using that as a figure of speech. Here's what my life is like. People all around me, they're shooting arrows at me. They're about to break me. They're about to destroy me. I praise the Lord. Why? For he has made marvelous. He's made it amazing. His loving kindness, that is, the good things he does for me. 
when I'm in big trouble. That's what this is saying. It's an amazing thing how loving and good and kind is when I'm like a besieged city. Blessed be the Lord. Praise Him. So in the midst of a hopeless situation, he sees the Lord showing him his loving kindness. Verse 22. This is interesting. It goes back to a time before when things weren't going so well and he couldn't think clearly. Listen to what he says. As for me, I said in my alarm, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried to you. Think of that besieged city for a moment. There was no help. There was no way out. If you surrendered, they were just going to kill you. You had no way out. David hit the panic button. He quit thinking clearly. And for a moment he said, As for me, I said in my alarm, I said in my panic, I was hurrying, I wasn't thinking clearly, I am cut off from before your eyes. That's a way of saying, God can't help me. Oh no, he was wrong. But sometimes when we get panicky, we get hurried in our thinking or what we want to say, we say the wrong thing, and that's what he did. He comes back and says, Even though it looks like I'm not going to get help, nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried to you. He still prayed. He wasn't really cut off before the Lord's eyes. It just seemed like it. He calls out to the Lord even when he's in the most difficult time of his life. He starts thinking clearly. Something you need to remember. When you can't think clearly, when you don't know what's going on, when you're under that big burden and you can't see God, you can't sense his presence, you can't sense anything that's going on around you. You remember. Call out to him. Call out to him. Call out to him. And he will hear you. He hears you in those most difficult times. He may not be visible. He may not seem like he's there. What do you do? You call out to him. David knew that when it came to hitting the panic button, if he hit the panic button, he'd turn around and hit the faith button. Let me tell you something about worry or panicking or not thinking clearly when things are so difficult. It'll short, it'll short circuit your faith. You know what short, short circuit means? You get static. It doesn't connect right. That's what's going on here. Do not let difficult circumstances short circuit your thinking because that leads to a short circuiting of your faith. And for a moment or two, you may quit thinking right. And you drop your trust. Get it back. Just get it back. That's all you got to do. And at the end of this psalm, he basically kind of says that. These are great lessons we must never forget. Even when it seems like the Lord is not there because of your own short-sightedness, you can't see him, he doesn't seem like he's there, cry out anyway. Cry out anyway. Because in your heart you know he's there, but he's just not answering it doesn't seem like he's there. Listen to these closing points in these last two verses. Love the Lord, all you his godly ones. Here's some lessons for his audience. Love the Lord, all you his godly ones. The Lord preserves the faithful and fully pays back the proud doer. First command, love the Lord. That means obey him. Just be obedient. In David's day, it was keep the covenant. Stay faithful. Do the right thing. 
All you, his godly ones, that's those who are faithful. Then two quick principles. The Lord preserves the faithful. He'll preserve you. He'll take care of you. And he fully pays back the proud door. He's going to deal with those people. He's going to deal with those who've tried to hurt you, who try to destroy you, who may have done a lot of damage already. They will get what's coming to them. Then finally, verse 24. Here's those words I was telling you a moment ago that remind us what to do in these difficult situations. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait on the Lord. Notice there's two or three things going on here at the same time. While you're waiting on the Lord to answer, don't give up. Don't give up. Be strong. Be courageous. Keep standing. Keep waiting. You put it in the Lord's hands. He may act at not just the last minute, but the last second. He will answer your need. After all that the Lord has done for David, as we've seen back and forth in this psalm of lament and then trust and problems and then trust, David ends by telling his audience that they should Number one, love the Lord. Then he goes on to say, be strong and let your heart take courage. All right? Keep waiting, resting, trusting in the Lord. Well, this was a long psalm, but I'm going to read through the translation. I'll probably make it a little faster than usual because there's a lot here. See how much of it that you can recall, but you have a good idea what this means now. Well, at least you should, huh? Psalm 31. For the director of music, a psalm of David. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Never let me be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me. Turn your ear to me. Quickly rescue me. Be to me a rock of safety, a house of strongholds to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. For the sake of your name, you lead me and guide me. You will free me from the net they hid from me. For you are my refuge. Into your hand I entrust my life. You will deliver me, O Lord, God of truth. I hate those who observe worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distresses of my life and you have not given me over into the hand of the enemy. You'll enable me to stand in a wide open place. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes waste away in vexation. Also my breath and my stomach are impaired. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years in groaning. My strength has failed because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. Because of all my enemies I am a reproach, especially to my neighbors and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I am forgotten as a dead man, out of mind. I'm like a broken vessel. For I've heard the slander of many, terror from all around, while they schemed together against me, they plotted to take my life. But as for me, I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servant. Save me in your loving kindness. Lord, do not let me be put to shame. For I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be silent in Sheol. Let the lying lips be mute, which speak arrogantly against the righteous with pride and contempt. How abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you. You work for those who take refuge in you before the sons of men. You hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of man. You conceal them in a shelter from the slander of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has made marvelous his loving kindness to me in a besieged city. As for me, I said in my alarm, I'm cut off from before your eyes. 
Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried, you, cried to you. Love the Lord, all you his godly ones. The Lord preserves the faithful and fully pays back the proud doer. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait on the Lord. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, what another wonderful psalm. So many applications and principles to learn and live by. So we ask that in the power of your Spirit, when we face these circumstances, that we too will, into your hands, commit our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.